FBI training, a postgraduate course. That target riddled, the next thing is some spectacular marksmanship at night. What they would do to a gangster stronghold. Atlantic City. Chief Federal Agent J. Edgar Hoover tells the Convention of Police Chiefs who the real public enemies are. Who are they, Mr. Hoover? They are the criminals themselves and their friends and allies who are engaged of their own free will in the business of attempting to make crime pay. the final curtain fell on an eight-mile battle to the streets of New York City between two payroll bandits, their driver and the police. The worst clash between gangdom and the law that America has ever known. On the sidewalk lies the body of one of the men who found out too late that crime does not pay. And in the 1930s, gang warfare exploded in New York. As it sped through the streets, a deadly hail of lead sprayed from these windows, mowing down all in its path. When it was all over, the crimson record showed that two policemen and a baby girl had been sacrificed in the war that crime has declared upon society, and that 11 others lay wounded in the hospitals. And here is a glistening badge of death that covered the heart of a hero policeman who didn't have a chance, a gunman's bullseye. Suddenly, Americans were told their country was overrun by bank robbers and kidnappers who would murder anyone who got in their way. On cinema newsreels every week, Americans could see the bloody aftermath of the gangsters' battles. They were outraged. No punishment can be too severe for these public enemies. They deserve the whipping post or worse. I'm not afraid to talk. I'll do all I possibly can to help the federal drive to put the gunmen and the racketeer behind the bars where they belong. Get these criminals behind prison walls. It's too bad that we even have to pay for their support. Their extermination would be much more satisfactory. Already, these rats are running for cover. And it's the duty of every law by the citizen to help hurt them from the hiding place and see that when caught, they are treated what they really are, rats. The Department of Justice declared war on public enemies. Outlaws like Dillinger falling before the guns of G-men. that crime does not pay. John Dillinger had made crime pay by robbing banks. The FBI displayed Dillinger's corpse warm and bleeding. The motor car and the machine gun spawned a new breed of criminals. To fight them demanded a new breed of police. The agents of the FBI were that new breed. They became heroes through the newsreels when they brought gangsters like Machine Gun Kelly and his wife to justice in 1933. Here's Machine Gun Kelly and his wife being sentenced by federal judge... When Machine Gun Kelly was captured, he's supposed to have cried out, Don't shoot, G-men, thus giving the FBI a nickname that would stick. In fact, Kelly surrendered to the Memphis police, but the FBI got the credit. It was the birth of a legend. The hard-boiled pair kept up their stoicism throughout the trial and conviction. But now they're being taken for a ride they didn't figure on. The FBI won more headlines gunning down bank robber Pretty Boy Floyd. Every time they killed a public enemy, they put the corpse on public display. With Floyd, it was understandable. He had killed seven policemen with his armory of guns. Ma Barker and her son were the next bandits killed by the G-men. Even an old lady could become a public enemy, armed with a machine gun. 
Robbers taken alive were also exploited for publicity. To any and all young fellows who may think that this is uh, an easy way of obtaining money, kindly take my advice, and if you are so tempted, why, forget it if you have to work for 10 cents an hour. Because in the words of Warden Laws of Sing Sing Prison, you can't win. The man who created the gang-busting image of the FBI was its director, J. Edgar Hoover. He was appointed director when he was only 29. He did not start out as a policeman. He had made his mark as a junior civil servant, rooting out communists in America's first Red Scare in 1919. Other police forces jailed many of America's biggest criminals, but the FBI usually scooped up the publicity. Our work in the future best can be judged by the events of the past. Every kidnapping case brought to our attention has been solved. Bank robberies have been cut in half. Extortionists have been consistently apprehended, and other forms of federal offenses have been vigorously prosecuted. Progress has been made. Hoover might boast of his successes with country boy bank robbers and kidnappers, but in the cities, the face of crime was changing. Between 1870 and 1930, 30 million immigrants poured into America. Millions settled in New York. They came searching for the good life. They thought they had come to the land of opportunity. Many of them were to be disappointed. The Italians, like other immigrants, usually settled in neighborhoods with people from their own country. But even here, they became the victims of exploitation and violence, for the Mafia had also crossed the Atlantic. The old Mafia bosses, the Mustache Peets, had simply transplanted their criminal brotherhood from Sicily to America. I was born on 15th Street and Avenue A, which is in the heart of Mulberry Street section. The original landing place for the Mustache Peets from Sicily, way back in the late 18, 1890s. What did you learn of the Mafia during your childhood? Well, I learned they were ruthless, vicious killers, no regard for life. And the, 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 the biggest complaint I had against them was that they they were parasites on their own people because their first source of income, the large source of income, was extortion. They would extort money from the laborer, the office worker, the factory worker, the professional man. There was no limit to the area of extortion. They extorted money that I know from my... I had an uncle who was a doctor, another was a pharmacist, and I'm sure they extorted a few pennies a week from my father, who was a, a photographer. My uncle had a drugstore, I can still recall, at the corner of 14th Street and Avenue A. He was a semi-bootlegger on the side. He was selling uh, alcohol. Almost daily murders were perpetrated right, right in front of his drugstore. During Prohibition, bootleg gangs fought for control of the illegal liquor business. In the 1920s, hundreds of gangsters were murdered in New York. Through murder, the bootleggers eliminated competition and kept prices high. In a few years, organized crime leaders made so much money, they could buy up entire police forces and the politicians who ran the police. In those days, the control of the police department and the district attorney's office was controlled by the politicians. I mean, any politician of any stamp or any standing could go and get what they call favors from the police, from the district attorney, and so on. So obviously it was to the interest of organized crime to develop, to, to contribute money to campaigns, to buy politicians, to control politicians, and that's what they did. In 1929, Jimmy Walker was re-elected mayor of New York. As a young man, he had been a popular songwriter with a huge public following. 
but for all his superabundant charm, he ran the most corrupt administration in New York history. Walker was a showman who loved playing host to international figures. But behind the razzmatazz, corruption in New York City was rife. Walker was forced to defend his record and his police force. I still believe, in fact I know, that ours is the most moral, best regulated, best police city in the entire civilized world. You caught my eye, now I got... In Mayor Walker's most moral city, there were 30,000 speakeasies and nightclubs making fortunes for organized crime. Gangsters were paying huge bribes to police and politicians to protect their gambling and bootleg operations. But in 1930, the scandal broke, forcing a public investigation into corruption in Mayor Walker's wide-open town. Politicians were depositing millions of dollars in their bank accounts and unable to account for them. And it started the what is known as the tin box parade, because when these politicians would get up on the stand in the course of the investigation, they would be asked, well, where did you get these millions of dollars that you deposited in, in the bank account? And since they really couldn't give any real explanation, they would always say, well, my uncle died, my grandmother died, and I put the money in a tin box. And I, every once in a while, when I needed the money, I would draw it out of the tin box. And that became known as the Tin Box Parade. And uh, that was demonstrated uh, week after week in the course of the investigation. And the same thing was true of Mayor Walker. And it resulted in the removal proceedings of Mayor Walker. Walker had piled up one million dollars he could not explain. Hi, hello, everybody. That's all I can say now, with a lot of other good stuff to follow. The good stuff followed in September 1932. The case against corrupt politicians was proved, and Walker was forced to resign. He made way for a reforming mayor, Fiorello LaGuardia. We intend, after January 1st, to reorganize the city government. We intend to have a general house cleaning. Yes, we'll not only clean the streets of this city, but I'm going to clean every department of every grafting Tammany politician and appoint honest men and women in their places. New Yorkers saw LaGuardia as the man to save them from corrupt politicians and the gangsters who owned them. The city celebrated as LaGuardia swept in on a landslide victory. The new mayor attacked the rackets from the start. Smash gambling, shouts New York's Mayor LaGuardia. So he smashes away at those cheating contraptions, the slot machines. He can add a gambling crusade with a hammer. Let the gamblers, tin horns, racketeers and gangsters take notice that they have to keep away from New York from now on. In this pile of battered junk were a thousand tricks for chiseling, jipping, swindling. They're going now to the place they belong, the garbage dump out at sea. They'll never chisel, jip, or swindle again unless some gangster fish rigs them up for the sucker fish. The mayor with a punch can also pitch. And down go the slot machines to the bottom of the sea. To clean up the city, Mayor LaGuardia worked closely with a prosecutor specially appointed to fight organized crime. He was a brilliant young lawyer. Mr. Dewey, you have been given the most difficult task, but the opportunity of helping the people of this city. LaGuardia backed the right man. Thomas Dewey was the first of the racket busters. He didn't just go after individual gangsters. He dug up every detail on the rackets they controlled. At his headquarters, Tom Dewey built up a team of incorruptible detectives, lawyers and accountants to prosecute the racketeers. He too exploited the cinema, mobilizing public opinion through newsreels and campaign films. For 20 years, the machine-controlled district attorneys of New York County have prosecuted nothing but the small fry and the victims of organized crime. During those years, the underworld has preyed on our people 
and rob them and then frighten them into silence. Now look here, Benton. You've been loading for Mason again. Now, for the last time, are you going to keep out of our territory or not? I'm not. But I don't need any protection. For five years, Dewey went after New York's best-known hoodlums, bootleggers like Legs Diamond, gambling bosses like Dutch Schultz, and drug kings like Waxy Gordon. In all, Dewey convicted nearly 100 gangsters. In 1936, his team stumbled on the most important criminal in America when they were investigating a prostitution racket. It was the weekend, I think, of February 1st or 2nd, 1936, when all 20 assistants and dollar a year men and investigators and police and accountants on the Dewey staff were given one assignment, and that was the raid on uh, houses of prostitution uh, throughout the borough of Manhattan and uh, into the office starting about 9 o'clock at night uh, came literally hordes of prostitutes, pimps, uh, uh, telephone operators at whorehouses, uh, uh, middlemen, uh, connections, all kinds of, of people, venereal and otherwise, and I use the term venereal, dope addicts, and we started at 8 or 9 o'clock at night and worked throughout the weekends. In those days, uh, uh, we weren't confined to what one would be confined to today, the rules with respect to uh, constitutional rights. We, uh, we were pretty rough. Dewey's investigators revealed Charles Lucky Luciano was the boss of New York prostitution. What no one on Dewey's staff knew was that Luciano was the supreme boss of the Mafia and had made it the most powerful criminal organization in America. Luciano was arrested in Arkansas and taken to New York. He had been born in Sicily. His American police record showed only minor convictions for drugs and gambling. The record did not show that in 1931, Luciano had killed off the old-style feuding Mafia bosses and set up a new national crime syndicate. At his trial, Luciano was found guilty and jailed for 30 to 50 years. Luciano was a big catch, but Dewey failed to follow through. He did not touch the Mafia organization Luciano had built up. In 1942, saboteurs set fire to ships in New York Harbor to stop America supplying its allies in the Second World War. Naval intelligence officers were told only Luciano could stop the sabotage because the Mafia controlled the docks. The Navy had to beg Luciano's help, even though he had been in prison for nearly six years. On his orders, the sabotage ceased. Later in the war, Luciano helped the American government again. Allied forces were about to land on Sicily. Luciano was asked if the Sicilian Mafia could help them. Wave after wave of landing craft surges ashore. Huge tank landing craft that sailed all the way from Britain and the US. The islanders cooperated with the American troops and the landing was a success. Sicily fell quickly. Luciano claimed the credit for the local Mafia's cooperation. After the war, Luciano was released from jail, allegedly for his contribution to the war effort. He was exiled to Italy, but even there, he was still the boss of the American underworld. Well, we got him out of the country, but we didn't neutralize his activities. Being stationed in Rome, having access to transatlantic telephone calls, uh, entertaining gangster visitors from the United States, it was obvious that uh, his, his power in the American underworld was not diminished at all. In fact, it was increased. So he was obviously sharing in the proceeds of American racketeering, and it was equally obvious that his voice was still as strong and meaningful as it was when he was in America. Therefore, his presence in Italy to us uh, was in no way 
neutralizing his activities. Sending Luciano into exile only increased the strength of the Mafia in America. From Italy, he masterminded the growth of Sicily's heroin trade with New York. Largely through Luciano, narcotics was becoming the Mafia's biggest money spinner. As the Mafia boomed, America's top policemen claimed it did not exist. Instead, J. Edgar Hoover hunted communists. The Communist Party of the United States is a fifth column if there ever was one. It is far better organized than were the Nazis in occupied countries prior to their capitulation. They are seeking to weaken America, just as they did in their era of, of obstruction when they were aligned with the Nazis. Their goal is the overthrow of our government. There is no doubt as to where a real communist loyalty rests. Their allegiance is to Russia, not the United States. While Hoover and the FBI were chasing Reds, Another federal police force was fighting organized crime almost single-handed. It was drugs which finally revealed the power of the Mafia, as the Bureau of Narcotics fought the heroin trade. The Bureau's chief, Harry Anslinger, claimed the Mafia controlled not just heroin, but all organized crime. The Treasury Department intends to pursue a relentless warfare against the despicable dope-peddling vulture who preys on the weakness of his fellow man. It was the shy and retiring Anslinger, not the publicity-seeking Hoover, who was America's greatest racket buster. He was the first one, to my knowledge, that ever saw the evil of organized crime in the United States. And the years back, I can recall, 1939, when we started to assemble files on the likes of uh, Lucky Luciano and Frank Estelle and all the big hoods, who at that time were just considered to be temporary nuisances. But he, he foresaw that they would become as powerful a, a, as they have become. Commissioner Anslinger, as he was known, of course, uh, was uh, a, a man that uh, recognized uh, in the mafia organization in the United States, linked with uh, their fraternal brothers uh, who were uh, in every major city of Italy and who had also infiltrated the, uh, uh, the French underworld, that they were a threat to uh, the United States in the way of uh, the importation and distribution throughout the country of, of uh, narcotic drugs. And uh, he felt uh, the necessity uh, to catalog and document and find out as much as possible about the organization to develop information uh, relative to it. And uh, up until 1936, uh, federal wiretaps were legal. Uh, he hired uh, numerous uh, crackerjack uh, uh, agents of Italian extraction uh, who spoke the languages, spoke the various dialects, and uh, he had a wonderful uh, policy of, of uh, using undercover penetrations of the organization. And uh, we, we documented the existence of the Mafia throughout the United States, particularly in our major metropolitan areas. In the 1950s, the Bureau of Narcotics put together its Mafia book, a remarkable work of criminal intelligence way ahead of its time. On 800 pages, the book listed the names, criminal records and activities of mafiosi all over America and Europe. On page 307 was Vito Genovese, Don Vito, the man who helped Luciano Americanize the old Sicilian Mafia in the 1930s. In 1946, he stood trial for murder, but was acquitted. In the next decade, Genovese would kill his way to the top of the Mafia in America. In a New York barber's shop in 1957, Genovese had his last rival eliminated. In a classic gangland execution, Albert Anastasia, himself once the Mafia's top hitman, was shot dead. Reporters now saw Genovese as America's godfather. Is it true that you're the head of the uh, Mafia in this country? It is not. It's true. Well, sir, have you ever been connected with the Mafia at any time? Never. What about uh, the government's charge that you're the right man, that you're the number one man in this narcotics uh, business? The charges are fantastic and ridiculous. You think and, that's, uh, that's what they are. And have you ever uh, known anyone in the narcotics racket? Have you not known I anyone? never did. Have you ever known anyone in the underworld? 
whole thing is ridiculous. What the is reporters the couldn't prove Genovese was the head of anything. I, I think you fellows have asked enough questions, and I think you ought to leave Mr. Genovese alone. He's a respectable businessman, and these charges are ridiculous and fantastic, and he wants to be left alone to continue to conduct his business in his ordinary manner. In 1959, the Narcotics Bureau finally jailed Genovese for 15 years as the boss of a multi-million dollar heroin ring. He was to die in jail. The immense power of Genovese was revealed by the informer Joe Valacci in 1963. He'd seen the transformation of the Mafia from warring when Italian gangs to a powerful American crime syndicate. Now, but when did you become a member of this organization. 1930. 1930. Why did you decide... Volacci was the first informer to reveal the Mafia was made up of crime families. He told senators the Genovese family was like an army, with Genovese at the top and hundreds of soldiers like himself at the bottom. About how many soldiers would usually be under a boss? Well, uh... Certain families have about, say, uh, Vito Genovese has about 450. 400 in and around that. Yeah, 450? About 400. After this kind of detailed evidence, not even Hoover could claim the Mafia did not exist. The Narcotics Bureau had been right all along. Milwaukee, uh, uh, for the first time, in a very organized way, answered all our questions. In other words, he identified specifically, precisely, the five families. And he identified who were in the families. And uh, his information, uh, we generally could corroborate because the, the affiliations he mentioned, we didn't have them in their complete form as he gave them, but we had much of it. So we knew from what he was telling us that it was, it was obviously uh, true. And uh, there is no question that anyone who analyzes his information, it was accurate, it was precise. And he identified the families, he identified the link-up, he identified the, uh, uh, the, the uh, organization, the Grand Council, and uh, the spheres of influence. And, and if you go into it in depth, you, you have a, a perfect uh, picture and understanding of the mafia organization in the United States. In Washington, the government at last recognized the power of the Mafia in American life by setting up special strike forces to fight organized crime. In future, lawyers and police forces would work together, armed with new laws against criminal conspiracies. To launch this drive against what he saw as one of the greatest threats to the great society, President Lyndon Johnson appeared, flanked by J. Edgar Hoover. General Captain Mack, uh, Director Hoover... At long last, Hoover recognized the threat, and he now supported President Johnson's declaration of war. I know how deeply all of you share my concern over the scope and the power of organized crime in this country. It constitutes nothing less than a guerrilla war against our society. This is a war that takes scores of lives each year in gangland violence. It is a war that terrorizes thousands of our citizens. The campaign against racketeering must not only be continued, but it must be accelerated. So I am today calling on each federal department and agency of this government that's been engaged in the war against organized crime to redouble its efforts. A society can be neither great nor just as long as organized crime exists. Through violence and corruption, the Mafia had taken a stranglehold on America. But now at last, the crime fighters were getting organized to fight organized crime. On the shores of Lake Erie stands Cleveland, Ohio, one of the largest cities in America. From the 1870s, hundreds of thousands of immigrants came to work in its steel factories and heavy industries. During Prohibition, Cleveland's position on the border with Canada made it an ideal smuggling center and one of the most lucrative cities for organized crime in America. On Cleveland's east side, around Mayfield Road and Murray Hill, a thriving Italian section grew up. Here, Italian criminals took to bootlegging with as much zeal as their cousins in New York and Chicago. In the 1920s, two Italian gangs, the Lonardos and the Pirellos, slaughtered each other for control of the Cleveland Mafia. 
by the end of Prohibition, one dynasty had fought its way to the top. John Scalish became its boss. Scalish died in 1975 of natural causes. He was succeeded by James Licavoli, an aging capo. Licavoli's underbosses were Tony Liberatore, the Mafia's corrupter of politicians. Angelo Leonardo, who ran the family's gambling and drugs rackets. And John Calandra, the Mafia's frontman in legitimate business. The Cleveland family under Licavoli became the target of the federal strike force set up to fight organized crime in the city. Cleveland Strike Force is one of 16 across America. It's led by Steve Ola. Morning, Marguerite. Steve Washington. Thank you. His team of lawyers, detectives, and accountants are drawn from all arms of law enforcement. In the 1970s, the Strike Force began to penetrate the Cleveland Mafia, or Cosa Nostra. In 1975, John Scalish, who was reputed to be the head of the Cleveland La Cosa Nostra family, died of natural causes. At that time, uh, James Licavoli was um, promoted and made uh, the head of the uh, La Cosa Nostra family in Cleveland. At about that time, there was a, a rather uh, brash, young Irish racketeer uh, who was beginning to make his, a name for himself in Cleveland. And his name was uh, Daniel Green, Danny Green. And he um, controlled an operation of um, young Irish fellows who were beginning to uh, pose a threat and a danger to these traditional activities of the Cleveland uh, organized crime family, the, the La Cosa Nostra family. Danny Green and his Irish gang were challenging the Italians on their own territory. Green killed several of Licavoli's top lieutenants and started to move in on the Mafia's rackets. Danny Green believed that he could take over organized crime activities in northern Ohio. His idea was that he would do it under the Irish banner, which uh, he, he, he had a green uh, Lincoln. He, 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 uh, he, his, his, uh, everything, everything he wrote it was in green ink. He had a green flag in front of his uh, house, and this was his image, and he felt that he could take over organized crime uh, through this, uh, using his Irish group. He was very offensive about the Italians, I understand. Yes, he would get on television, call the La Cosa Nostra figures, figures maggots, and uh, he would, uh, they, they had made about eight attempts to kill, to kill him over a period of years, and uh, he, was, he felt he was indestructible. They blew up his house. Uh, he fell from the second floor to the basement, landed on a refrigerator, and walked away. They, they tried to kill him in a park when he was jogging. He uh, took out a 38 revolver and, and killed one of the, uh, the hitmen. They, uh, they made many attempts uh, on his life, which all failed. The Mafia couldn't kill Green, but they did blow up his ally, John Nardi, in May 1977. Green was now even more exposed, but he flaunted himself on television after Nardi's murder. Jenny, there was some speculation out on the street back in March that uh, John Nardi was a target. Did, did you talk to John Nardi at all about this? I haven't personally seen John in about three and a half months, but I did send him a message very recently that John be careful. It's out here very, very strong in the streets that somebody's out to get you. Now, from what I can say is, is that everybody says they heard this also. The investigator should start right there and go from who told you and where did they hear it from. Do you got any thoughts about where these people are from? I thought, I think poss possibly, most probably, the bomb was made here. The people could have been imported. To kill the Irishman now became the Cleveland Mafia's number one priority. After failing eight times themselves, they decided to bring in an outsider. The contract to kill Green was given to Ray Ferrito. Ray Ferrito was a hitman from California. Ferrito had already carried out a murder for the Los Angeles crime family. While I was in California, a problem arose with uh, a man who was uh, giving uh, many people problems uh, and uh, bringing a lot of heat by the law enforcement agencies to other people. And uh, was he was he a, I, uh, a criminal? Or? 
Yes, he was a criminal. He was a non-bank robber and burglar. And uh, I took care of that problem by uh, taking him out to the airport and shooting him in the head. Ferrito was a killer with an ambition. He wanted to join the Cleveland family. The bosses agreed to make him a member and cut him in on their gambling profits. He soon realized why they needed him to kill Green. Well, they were very disturbed. Uh, it seemed like every attempt that was made uh, either was fouled up or uh, it didn't work. The man was a Green who was cautious, uh, by no means uh, ignorant. Uh, he took precautions, uh, precaution measures whenever he went somewhere, place uh, there was someone with him. Uh, he always carried a gun. And uh, he seemed like uh, a man that uh, was invincible, a uh, man with uh, nine lives. As you know, it's widely speculated that you are also a target in this so-called, quote, gangland war for control. What's your answer to that? The world of uh, the streets, I happen to have an unenviable position, a very inter uh, uh, enviable position of many people because I'm in between both worlds, a square world and a street world, and I think I have trust from both sides. But I have no, uh, no ax to grind, but if somebody wants to come after me, uh, we're over here by the Celtic Club. I'm not hard to find. Finding Green wasn't the problem. Killing him was. Green lived in a block of apartments where Ferrito first tried to kill him with a bomb in a box. FBI agent John Summer worked on the case. Now, Danny Green, although he lived a fast life, wanted to live in, a, in this, this uh, apartment because it catered mostly to the elderly. And uh, when he wasn't in the public eye, he could hide away up here without any uh, media. Up here on the uh, right, right near the front of the door, is where the bomb box was planted. At the time, which was in 1977, there was a lot of shrubbery there. It was a directional bomb box with a force uh, going out towards the door. And uh, they gave up on their attempts uh, to do it, mainly because there were so many elderly people uh, that were always seemed to linger by the doorway or uh, at least stand out waiting for buses and so on and so forth. The bomb was to be detonated across the street near the White House and uh, a streak of no nobility, I guess, on the part of the mob, they decided not to go ahead with the plan because so many innocent people would be killed. It was shortly after uh, we decided not to use the bomb box, which I called it, uh, that we decided to uh, tap his telephone. I got a key to an apartment in the building while in the building, we went down into the manager's office and found his lines and tapped the phone and hooked it up to uh, the dead phone that was in the apartment where we were living. Well, well, there was you... many phone calls that uh, we overheard. One, uh, especially that I remember, is that uh, he used to uh, be in contact with the uh, uh, FBI and uh, he gave an alias when he called the FBI, and he was an informant for the FBI. Uh, when this was told, or when the tape was heard by Licavoldi and others, uh, it confirmed what they had thought in the beginning, and it became uh, more of a thing we have to get him soon. In October 1977, Ferrito heard Green telephoning his dentist. When Green turned up for his dental appointment, Ferrito was waiting for him. We decided that uh, there would have to be more than one plan because uh, Mr. Green was the type of guy who uh, thought himself as a general. So we had a bank of crew. There was another crew there, two fellows with the high-powered scoped rifle who were parked in the uh, parking lot of the building where the dentist was located. And uh, they were supposed to take a shot at him if there was an opening. But they uh, chickened out and they left. And so we used the last uh, method that we had. That was the bomb car. We uh, had a car that was set aside 
And in the car, there was a box built to the side of the door of the car where we would put the dynamite, which we would park next to his car. And uh, we would trigger it off at a distance. It happened that when he did come for his uh, dental appointment, we were there and waited till he uh, came out of the building. When he went to get into his car, uh, I ignited the, uh, the dynamite with the remote control device. Danny Green had lost his war with the Cleveland Mafia. The Irishman was dead. At that point, were you elated? Did you get any thrill out of having finally done the job? Yes. It, uh, I w wasn't elated because of I killed someone. I was elated because the job was done and I was going to become one of them and uh, share in the profits. Uh, something that... Uh, since I was a kid, uh, I dreamed of, you know, I wanted. And that, this was my chance to do it. Didn't you have any, uh, any kind of uh, compunction, any uh, remorse? You'd, you'd got to know this man very well, hadn't you? Yes. Well, how does it feel to kill somebody that you, that you know every living breath of because you're tapping his phone, you're... You, you're living in the same building with him. What, what's it like to have a man as a target? Well, to me, it was like uh, having a glass of wine. It didn't mean a thing to me. I killed him, and, uh, and I, there was uh, no remorse that I killed the man because that was part of my life. I was brought up... Uh, uh, all through my life, believing that those, you just have to put them out of your mind. Those were things uh, or hurdles that you had to overcome. A man with a conscience uh, doesn't last too long on the streets. Green's killing in broad daylight in a car park caused a public outcry. At that point, uh, it became uh, apparent that uh, we had uh, a full-scale gangland uh, war occurring here uh, that um, thus far it appeared that innocent people had not been victims of that war but that certainly if it continued that possibility was was a great one so it was determined that uh, an effort should be made and a very concerted effort on our part to um, attempt to solve these murders and attempt to put a stop to this, to this violence as a result of that we put a task force together under the auspices of, of the strike force and uh, we set up this task force in an effort to uh, to solve the, the murder of Green as well as the murder of one John Nardi who was a Green associate and murdered uh, about four months prior to uh, to Green. Do you want to review exactly what we accomplished with his testimony this morning? Right. The task force was made up of investigating lawyers, bomb experts, local policemen and FBI agents. The FBI usually dominates strike force cases. Today, 1,500 FBI men investigate organized crime, a far cry from the early days of J. Edgar Hoover. Didn't we have uh, the shooting of Joe DeRose uh, that we just prosecuted, Pete Cascarelli on? We recovered a 22 with a silencer there, Yes, that was a 22, and then the... Uh, Cooperating in ways which would not have been possible before the strike forces were set up, the Cleveland team solved Green's murder in a few days. But it still needed some luck. That somehow he and the mob were enemies, right? Yes. Right. We caught a break in the sense that there was an eyewitness who heard the explosion and uh, was driving by, and the car with out-of-state Pennsylvania plates, which which Ferrito was driving, sped by her, went right down a ramp onto an interstate. She recorded the the number of on the license plate, and we were able to uh, to trace it back to someone who was. Uh, a friend of, of Ferrito's, and uh, through some investigative work at that point, some grand jury investigation, some leads that were run, we were able to satisfy us that we had sufficient uh, probable cause to arrest Ray Ferrito, which we did. 
While Ferrito was awaiting trial, he learned the Mafia bosses who had hired him to kill Green were planning his murder. Their treachery appalled him. All my life I've been one way and I always did what I was supposed to do. And now all of a sudden I'm, I did him the biggest favor that they wanted done. And they're talking about killing me. And here I am in jail waiting trial. And uh, it was at that time that uh, I decided to, uh, to flip. And uh, by flipping, I mean go to the authorities and tell them that uh, I wanted to talk to them, but I wanted a deal. Uh, it wasn't because I saw God or I read a Bible, you know. It was just that I thought at that time that I had to look out for me, Ray. And I thought that that would be my best move. So Ray Ferrito decided to betray the Mafia. His evidence would put the leaders of the Cleveland family on trial for murder. James Licavoli, the boss who had brought the Cleveland family to the verge of destruction. John Calandra, the man who day by day had conspired with Ferrito to kill Green. Tony Liberatore, who had organized the cars and the weapons for the murder. Licavoli's lawyer claimed they were innocent. I don't think that these men are, are, are dangerous. Uh, they're, they're gentle souls. Uh, uh, they're just misunderstood. And uh, that's, my, that's my feeling on the matter. I, I don't think that they're dangerous. During the trial, Licavoli and Calandra showed how gentle they could be with waiting reporters and photographers. Get out of here! Largely on Ferrito's evidence, the strike force convicted the three bosses. James Licavoli was jailed for 17 years for conspiracy to murder and for controlling the Mafia. John Calandra was sentenced to 14 years for conspiracy to murder and for controlling the Mafia. Tony Liberatore was jailed for 14 years for conspiracy to murder and for controlling the Mafia. Within months, the family's last underboss, Angelo Leonardo, was tried for drug trafficking, murder, and for controlling the Mafia. Despite attempts to play up his frailty, he was jailed for life. The strike force had put away the entire leadership of the Cleveland mob. But both the strike force and the FBI know the Mafia is far from finished. We haven't broken the back of, of the Cleveland La Cosa Nostra. I think we have a long way to go yet before we can say that. All we've done so far is to take the leadership out, take the, the boss, the underboss, and the capos. We still have a very active organization here. The, the members and the non-members are still uh, conducting loan sharking, gambling, narcotics operations. We have to attack those operations now. There is too much money to be made by organized crime and there is too much money to be made in a city like cleveland ohio which is a large industrial blue collar town which has a ready and willing market for the goods and services that organized crime has to offer and they're not going to allow that gambling to dry up they're not going to allow that narcotics uh, use dry up they're not going to allow that prostitution use to dry up so it's not going to be forgotten there will be efforts made to reinstill that power here in, into cleveland the Mafia bosses have been taken off the streets of Cleveland. Putting them all in jail is the greatest success any strike force has ever had against a Mafia family. But the racket busters know the family isn't going to fade away. It will renew its leadership, reassert its power. Ray Ferrito knows that power. After three years in jail, he is back on the streets. The Mafia have sworn to kill him. I know that I'm as capable of taking care of myself as the guy that they send to take care of me. And uh, it's just a matter of time for me. And I'd be a fool to say that it isn't, that uh, sooner or later that, that they're going to get me. <laughs>